Church, let's grab our Bibles. We're going to be in a new book. We're going to be in Joel. I'm going to be honest with you, it's a hard book to find in the Old Testament. Uh, Open your Bible up about two-thirds of the way through. If you can't find it, uh, go to the table of contents, look it up. There's no shame in doing that. But we are in Joel chapter 1 this morning. We're going to look at verses 1 to 12. And when you find that in your Bible, will you go ahead and stand up with me as we acknowledge here at Gospel Fellowship that God's Word is inspired, it is inerrant, it is infallible, the only Word of the true and living God. Joel chapter 1, verses 1 to 12. Listen now to the Word of our Heavenly Father. Joel uh, 1, verse 1. The Word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, Hear this, you elders, give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. Verse 4, what the cutting locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust has left, the hopping locust has eaten. What the hopping locust has left, the destroying locust has eaten. Awake, you drunkards, and weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth, and it has fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off. Their bark and throwing it down, their branches are made white. Verse 8, Lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn and the ministers of the Lord. The fields are destroyed. The ground mourns because the grain is destroyed. The wine dries up. The oil languishes. Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil. Wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine dries up, and the fig tree languishes. Pomegranate, palm, and apple are the trees of the field, are dried up, and gladness dries up from the children of man. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I don't know if you've taken a good look at a bug lately, but they're fairly disgusting creatures, aren't they? Uh, Bugs are are absolutely hideous. If you look at them up close, if you dare, take a a magnifying glass and have a good look at one. Look at an ant's in your garden. Look at a a lamp moth, if you dare. Uh, Pick a common housefly, if you want to. Bugs are hideous creatures. They look something like uh, space aliens and, and dinosaurs and like the aberrations of horror movies if you really want to look close and if you were the same size as the bug in your in your yard underneath any rock you would flee from it you would run you would cower I promise you we're not even talking about spiders yet spiders are the the worst of all eight eyes and eight legs and hairy thorax and just creepy fangs uh, but but of all the all the strangeness of these grotesque creatures. There is no, there is no insect in the in the in the world of bugs that would terrify an agrarian society like the locust or the grasshopper. And the locust or the grasshopper has an incredible power to destroy virtually all life for thousands of square miles. And they come not in the millions, but in the billions at times. And this is the, the context of the book of Joel. Joel prophesies during a, during a time of, of an incredible locust plague wherein millions or even billions of these strange creatures came and they devoured veritably all of the green of, of the land. And so uh, today we're going to begin to, this new study in this book of Joel. And we're going to spend about eight weeks here, as far as I can tell, about eight weeks in this book. And then You probably already know that after this book, we're going to be heading into then the book of Revelation, where we're going to spend about 72 Lord's Days together working through that book. And this is somewhat intentional on the part of David and I thinking through our preaching series as that is to come. We've just finished up 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, which undoubtedly have quite a bit of theme related to eschatology, that is to say the study of the end times we saw in the Thessalonian correspondence is much related to the return of Christ. And so before we get to the book of Revelation, which is our intention to get there this fall, 
David and I thought it would be wise for us to go back to one of the Old Testament prophecies because before we get to a Revelation, we need, we need to notice the fact that Revelation quotes from and alludes to the Old Testament more than any other book in the New Testament. In fact, if you were to take all of the quotations and allusions of the other New Testament books and add them up, Revelation has them beat even if they were combined. Revelation is constantly referring to either by direct quotation or at least uh, allusion to uh, images and metaphors and similes the, the Old Testament throughout. And so we want to kind of use this book as somewhat of an on-ramp to our study of Revelation so that we can pick up some of the apocalyptic language that is commonly used by these sorts of prophets. And so even in Joel, we're going to find that a number of the images are drawn straight from Joel and the author, John, of Revelation. He will very commonly uh, uh, transport them right into the text. And you're assumed that you already know some of that Old Testament background. And so in Joel, uh, the book of Revelation is going to borrow from all sorts of themes, trumpets and locusts and darkness and earthquakes and horses. And the author of the apocalypse is going to assume that you get the reference. So that's why it's so important for us to go back through at least one such Old Testament book. And so we've picked Joel because of the themes that Joel looks at. They're going to help us in our study of Revelation. So this morning, my job is really just to introduce this book where we'll be for a couple of months. I hope you do have your Bible open with me this morning. I'm essentially just going to be working through this text, verses 1 to 12. Most everything I say is going to be drawn right from the verses in this particular passage, so please have that out on your lap with you. Let's go ahead and just remark about the first verse here in this text. It says, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Now, to be completely honest, we don't know much about Joel, who he was as a historical person, and I promise you it's not because I didn't do my homework in preparing for this morning. It's simply because we don't have a lot of background about who Joel is. Uh, he tells us the name of his father, Pethuel, but if you were to look that up uh, in some sort of Bible search or concordance, you're going to come up with nothing because we don't know who Pethuel is. And so not only do we not know much about Joel in terms of his biography, but we don't know much about his background either. The one thing I can tell you with certainty is that Joel's name means Jael, or the Lord is God. And so you probably know that the divine name Yahweh can sometimes be shortened as Jah. And so if you take Jah, which is the shortened form of Yahweh, and attach it to El, which is the common Hebrew word for God, you have Jael or Joel. So therefore, his name is his message. He's preaching that the Lord is God. Uh, if you know somebody named Elijah, it's the same name, just flipping the two syllables. El, God, Jah is the Lord. And so the names mean the same thing. Other than that, we don't have a lot of background about who Joel is. We do know this one thing from verse 1, and that is that he has received a message from the Lord, and he is, he is bent on delivering it with fidelity to the people. In fact, that's, it's sort of convenient that we don't know much about Joel's biography or his background because Joel wants to get out of the way. He doesn't want, a true prophet never wants to be the center of his own message. A true prophet merely wants to convey the message that the Lord has given to him to preach to his people. And so, to that extent, Joel is essentially the perfect prophet because he just wants to preach and get out of the way. What does he preach? He preaches faith. How does he preach faith? By way of repentance. And so you're going to see that coming up as a theme quite a bit throughout this book. Now, normally, if I was introducing a prophet, one of the things that I would do, again, is I would tell you a little bit about the historical background of said prophet. Unfortunately, with this book, again, we, don't have, al we have almost nothing in terms of historical background. We don't know much about the context. The only thing we know is that there was a plague of locusts, and that's what Joel is responding to. And typically, if you were to look up the first paragraph of any other prophet, they would at least give you some context clues as to when that prophet lived. For instance, in Isaiah, we studied that whole book. It's been months now. That series is getting further into our rearview mirror. But when we looked at Isaiah, the opening paragraph of Isaiah says that he received his prophecy in the days of Uzziah and Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah. And so we can at least generally say that Isaiah lived from 740 to 680 B.C., and so we know some kind of context about him. If we were to look up the, the prophet Jeremiah in the first paragraph of that book, he tells us that his prophecy came in the 13th year of Josiah, so we can pin it down 
to 627 B.C. Some of the prophets, we know exactly when they lived. And unfortunately, again, Joel gives us nothing about his historical setting such that we can't even guess. Even the best scholars can basically say somewhere between the 9th century B.C. and probably the 4th century B.C. That's a 500-year range, and we've got nothing to tell us more specifically than that. No kings, uh, no specific battles, no major world events that we can pin this to. And so we take this then as a, a very general prophecy of a faithful prophet who merely wants to preach faith and repentance to the people of God. And so that's what we have here this morning. Now what I want to do is I want to, I want to kind of break up this passage, these 12 verses, into, into three basic observations that I want to make uh, um, by way of introduction. First, we're going to look at the people to whom Joel is addressing. All right, so we're going to spend some time looking at who he's talking to because he gives us some pretty specific, uh, some pretty specific information here. Secondly, after that, we're going to look at the problem that he is addressing. And then finally, we're going to look at then the purpose of the book in general. So first the people that he's addressing, then the problem that he's discussing, and then finally we're going to try to make a summary of the purpose of the book as a whole. So again, Bible's out. Let's start with the first question here. To whom is Joel preaching? Well, he gives us some specific information about his target audience here in verses 1 and 2. Go back to your Bible and look at this in verse 2. He says, hear this, you elders. Give ear all inhabitants of the land as such a thing happened in your days or the days of your fathers, tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. So actually, Joel has kind of a broad spread audience in his mind here. Uh, If Joel is hunting, he's using a shotgun and not a rifle because he's going to kind of scatter blast this message out to virtually anybody that will listen to him. And so you might say to yourself, is, is Joel talking to me? My answer to that would be yes. Uh, is Joel talking to the person next to you? Again, the answer is yes, but don't forget, you just agreed that he's speaking to you. And so what Joel does is he, he begins then to address three particular groups here. And let's just go through these. First of all, Joel says specifically in verse 2, he is addressing the elders. Do you see that in verse 2? Hear this, you elders. Now, The word in the Hebrew obviously has connotations of age. It has connotations of wisdom. The elders of a particular community or even a church are supposed to be those people who have accumulated life circumstances and and, uh, they've been through some stuff before and so they have some accumulated wisdom. I was actually reading this in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. And when when I looked at that word, I was sort of surprised. I guess I shouldn't have been that the Septuagint has here for the word elders, the word presbyteros. Does that sound familiar to anybody? That's right, because the Septuagint was the pew Bible of the early Christian church. They were reading the Old Testament scriptures, usually in the Septuagint Greek. And so when the early church would have come across this verse, they would have saw the word presbyteroi, or the presbyteros, or as we know it, the presbyterian which would be the elders that we recognize as having authority, leading authority in our own congregation, right? Because we're Presbyterian. That means our church is led by elders. And don't you just find that interesting? At least I do. That as Joel is about to launch his message, the first people that he has in his eyes and in his mind is the elders, the spiritual leaders of the congregation, the spiritual leaders of the people of God. You say, well, shouldn't they be the most mature? Yes, they should. But if the elders don't have softened hearts to the Word of God, then, then what hope do the rest of us have? Are the elders are supposed to be those people who, who so love the Lord and are so, their, heart, their hearts are soft to the message of the Lord that they've actually received this calling that they want to step out in faith and lead the people of God. And if the elders themselves in some way, think of themselves as being exempt from the message of the prophets, then how could they qualify to be leaders? Right? And so, uh, here at Gospel Fellowship, we have 12 elders on the session. We have two pastors, and we have 10 ruling elders, and we have other elders besides. And so I just just want to be fairly clear this morning, as always, that the elders are included 
in the sermons that come from this pulpit. We have you in our gauge, so to speak. We're aiming at you. If it ever seems that maybe I'm talking to you, it's only because it's true. If you have weak elders, you have weak churches, if you have weak presbyters, you have weak presbyteries. Now, I am fairly convinced here that our elders are faithful and strong, but I do want you to know, brothers, that at least as far as Joel is concerned, you're part of the recipients of this message. It's not going to go over your heads to somebody else before it first comes to us. And by the way, every arrow that comes from this pulpit had better have pierced my own heart too before it goes out, right? So yes, the spiritual leaders are clearly in view here, but Joel is not about to let anybody else off the hook. If you're saying to yourself this morning, well, good thing I'm not an elder, look at what he says next. He says this, Give ear all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? So everybody here is included in Joel's message. If you have money or status or position or rank or wealth or title, none of those things are going to get you off the hook as far as Joel is concerned. This message is for absolutely everybody throughout the land. There is no rank or social social privilege that is going to count for you such that Joel is not preaching to you and at you. And sometimes the, uh, the people that don't have leadership responsibility in a church or a society, it's, it's fairly easy for them to place the blame on everything that goes wrong at their leaders. We do that very well here in America, right? If things go off the, off the hook, we tend, to, we tend to blame the leaders. And sometimes that's exactly right. And sometimes it's not. And it's sometimes hard to tell whether it's the leader's fault or whether it's the people's fault. In this case, though, Joel has everybody in mind. Somebody says, drain the swamp. I agree, but first drain the swamp of your own heart. It's easy to point at the king. It's easy to point at the president or the senator or the council or the governor or the bishop or whoever's in charge. But if your heart isn't made right first, what good is it for you to level critiques against your leaders? All right, so picks on the leaders, and he goes to everybody else. And then after that, it's interesting here, at least I find this interesting, who does Joel also include in this prophecy? Look at the next line. Look at verse 3. Tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. So Joel even has in mind here, in his prophetic exhortation, the very smallest amongst the people of God. Now this is a theme that's going to come back In the book of Joel, in fact, Joel is often going to say things with direct application to even the smallest among us in our congregation. For instance, uh, skip with me ahead one chapter. Let's just go to chapter 2 for a moment. Joel is going to try to summon a solemn assembly of the people of Israel to gather together to repent and to pray for forgiveness. And in chapter 2, we're going to come to this later, uh, Joel says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, uh, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders and the children. Look at this now. Even nursing infants are included. And so in our, in our congregation, um, you know, we, we take children pretty seriously here, don't we? We, we baptize our babies. We are pedo baptistic in our, in our understanding of the covenants. And sometimes uh, other, other denominations will tease each other about our views of baptism. You're, and say, you're a credo Baptist or you're a pedo Baptist. And we kind of we joke about these things. Sometimes we banter about it more, more intensely online. We argue about baptism. But let me tell you this. One thing about being a, a child a covenant child baptizing congregation like us, is that we take the role of discipling and raising our children in the Lord very seriously. Yes, we do. Because we include them in and amongst the people of God. That's why we baptize our children. One of the reasons. And by the way, just kind of a little tangent here, we're looking for a youth director right now. Right? And so we're praying that God would bring to us somebody who absolutely loves children and youth and teens and loves Christ and loves the word and wants to spend at least a portion of their life doing this very thing, discipling our children. So if you or somebody you know fits that description, come talk to us. 
And by the way, again, we're going to need some volunteers in our children's ministry as well. So Joel lays out a fairly blanket approach here to addressing absolutely everybody, the spiritual leaders. He calls on them particularly. He doesn't let any inhabitants off the, uh, of the land off the hook easily. And then he specifically and also includes children and even infants throughout his prophecy as part of the people of God that will be called to respond in whatever ways they're capable of responding. We teach our children to love their Savior even before they can say the words Jesus of Nazareth, right? Okay, so that's the people that Joel is addressing. Now let's go on to then, secondly, the problem that Joel is speaking to here. The problem is obviously in verse 4, this locust plague that has come upon the land. And we're going to say much more about this as we work through the prophecy, especially in including in chapter 2. But let's go ahead and read verse 4 here and see how Joel begins to address this problem. He says in verse 4, What the cutting locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. And what the swarming locust has left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust has left, the destroying locust has has eaten. Now, you can't necessarily tell this from reading the Bible here in English, but in the Hebrew, you can tell Joel's a very skillful writer because he uses four different words for grasshopper or locust. Four different Hebrew words here. That's why in the, in the English, we've got to kind of modify it. Cutting locust, swarming locust, hopping locust, destroying locust. Because the Hebrew language has actually nine words for grasshoppers or locusts. And you say to yourself, Well, why in the world would they need nine different words for the same disgusting little bug, right? Well, uh, depending on how important a certain thing is to a culture or how dangerous a thing is to a culture, a certain language groups have devised all kinds of vocabulary to try to define those things. You may have learned in English class that there are certain uh, tribes in the the Arctic that have over a hundred words for snow. Have you ever heard that before? There, there, are certain, there are certain peoples that live, uh, live uh, in the Arctic areas. They have dozens and dozens of words for snow. And you say, well, what's different about snow? It's the white, fluffy stuff. Well, yeah, but uh, there's the white, fluffy stuff, and there's thick snow, and there's wet snow, and there's packy snow, and there's ice, and there's thin ice, and dangerous ice, and hail that falls. And so people tend to develop words for their societies based on either how much a thing is valued or, conversely, how dangerous a certain thing poses to survival. And in this case, the Hebrews, being people of the ancient Near East, they have nine words at least to describe what locusts can do because, trust me, if you are a farmer or if you live in an agrarian society that heavily depends upon the fruit of the land, this is probably the worst thing that can ever happen to you. Besides an invading army, right? This locust plague, um, we are, we're told in other places, I was looking at a couple of uh, commentaries on this, and one commentary said that locust plagues can absolutely destroy 200,000 acres of farmland, completely annihilated. Uh, one study that looked at a, a, a plague that came through California, I think it was about 100 years ago, 200,000 acres were covered. They estimated some 24 billion creatures in that, in that particular plague, and they were stacked literally on top of each other by threes and fours. Just have the ability to entirely wipe out absolutely everything. And so this is why Joel then, what Joel does here, and this is, this is somewhat poetic on his part, is he's, be, he's going to begin to use what we might call apocalyptic language. Now, apocalyptic language is essentially images and metaphors on steroids, right? To convey terror and to convey seriousness. That's what apocalyptic language is. And this is one of the reasons why we're studying Joel before we get to the book of Revelation, which undoubtedly uses apocalyptic language all over the place. One of the greatest mistakes you can try, that you can make with the book of Revelation is to try to over-literalize what are clearly meant to be metaphors and images and similes. And so you're you're even going to notice this comparison here between Joel 1 and Revelation 9, which we read in our earlier reading, that what, what Joel does and what John, the apocalyptic writer, does is he takes these little creatures and he supplements them with the power of a different animal. Notice in verse 6, What Joel says here is, uh, verse 6, For a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. So what did Joel do? 
well, he took two creatures and he merged them together to form the image of a new, more terrifying creature. You got flying locusts, but now they're supplemented with the power of lion's teeth. Does Joel really mean that lions are going to take up wings and fly and destroy the crops? Of course not. He's using apocalyptic language here. And so the same thing as what John, the writer of the apocalypse, does in Revelation chapter 9. He takes one creature, i.e. locusts, and combines it with the power of another creature, that is to say scorpions, and now you have a more terrifying plague that's befallen you, right? Okay, so that's what John just did, is he borrowed from Joel's use of combining creatures to form a more furious animal. And by the way, just so we're all clear, Locust plagues are promised throughout scriptures as judgments of God upon a, 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 um, a wandering people. Just look at that in Deuteronomy chapter 28, 29. Go back to the, the, the eighth plague in the story of the Exodus. Plagues of locusts are one of the things that God warns his people about. Now, why is this locust plague so terrifying to the people. Well, let's look at a couple of specifics here about why this is going to be so problematic. Look at verse 5 in your text. Awake, you drunkards, and weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. Okay? So Joel goes after drunkards here first. Why is, he, why is he picking on them? Well, because, because you can't get drunk if you don't have wine. And you can't have wine if you don't have grapes. And you can't have grapes if you don't have a vineyard. And you can't have a vineyard if it has been absolutely ripped away from you. And so one of the things that Joel is trying to convey here is, look, people of God, you don't want to sober up? The Lord will sober you up by taking away that which you depended on. By the way, this is more than just the, the, the drinking of alcohol that we're talking about here, God is warning the people that he will sober them up by judging them. He will tear away from you that which you have come to depend on. You can be drunk on material possessions, can't you? God can take that away from you. You can be drunk on your vanity of your body or your appearance, and God can and will take that away from you. You can be drunk on fame. You can be drunk on your career. You can be drunk on any number of things that take your heart and your focus away from the only true and living God. And what happens is this. If you continue to be so inebriated by your own life and your own things, the Lord will take it away from you such that sobriety is forced upon you. I have a a particular family member. Some of you know my background. I don't need to say it again this morning. But I have a particular family member that struggles with addiction And sometimes when this person calls us on the phone, we can tell within like two seconds whether or not she's sober. And usually when this person is is very, very sober, it's because she happens to be in prison or jail. And God has a way, doesn't he, of forcing us to a state of awakeness or sobriety. And oftentimes the way he does that, if we won't willingly sober up ourselves, is he will simply rip away from you what you thought you were depending on. In this case, freedom. Right? And so God is warning the people that he will force and awaken sobriety upon them by taking away from them that which they depended on. Now, look at this. This is interesting, though, because... Because it's easy, it's easy, isn't it? It's too easy to just blame the drunkards in verse 5. What about the common people? What about the blue-collar people? What about the people who are just trying to work hard for a living? Well, he brings them in in verses 10 and 11 when he addresses the workers of the fields. Look at verse 10. The fields are destroyed. The ground mourns because the wine is destroyed. The wine dries up. The oil languishes. And he says this in verse 11, quite unexpectedly, I think. Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil. Wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. And so you're thinking here about just simple farmers, right? I mean, these are the hardworking people. These are the people that show up for their jobs. These are the people that, that do their work, and they put in a good day's, uh, a day's labor. And, and why would God bring judgment on them? Well, part of, the, part of what we miss as Western thinkers, I think, um, our Western culture and society is, is so rigorously individualistic, we almost can't help but thinking about everything, even reading our Bibles through an individualistic lens. Does that make sense? 
very bent on individualism in the West. In the East, however, people are very communal and they see themselves as being part of a nation. They see themselves as being part of a community. Well, which one's right? Which, which is the biblical view? Actually, both. Because the Bible very often speaks of us as individuals, and yet the Bible also calls us into account as churches and peoples and even nations here. And what we're seeing here in this passage in verses 10 and 11 is that even those people that you might think are, quote, innocents, are actually part of the very nation that is about to be judged by God. So it's not that they're not guilty. It's not that they're innocents. But it's that God does sometimes reckon with peoples as nations. And in this case, he is bringing a judgment on the whole of the nation. Therefore, nobody is going to be exempt from the judgment he brings. Okay. Now, that, that's only to compound the problem a little bit because there's one more thing here that you need to see and that might not be immediately obvious uh, unless we know a little bit about the background here. But look at verse 9. Because the, the problem here is that even the temple sacrificial system is going to be threatened by this plague. How so? Well, look at verse 9. The grain offerings and the drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn and the ministers of the Lord. The fields are destroyed. Now remember, so we're Christians, right? We don't have to bring sacrifices to the temple when we come to worship the Lord on his holy day. We don't do that anymore. And the reason why we don't bring bulls and goats and other such offerings, grain offerings and sheep, we don't have to do that anymore is because for us, Christ has come and he is both the perfect temple for us as well as the perfect sacrifice. Yes, right? But remember, in the, in the Old Testament system here where there's still the temple system is still in effect, and the people of God are still expected to bring bulls and goats and sheep and even grain offerings to the temple, what then do you do if even that whole system is cut off because of the plague? In other words, this is going to be absolutely terrifying for the people of God because they can't even come to the temple to apologize. What do you do then? What do you do when repentance is required of you and you can't come to repent because you have no offering to bring? then you are in a world of hurt. And then you depend exclusively on the mercies of Almighty God. Yes? You ever tried to apologize to somebody that won't pick up the phone? It's painful, isn't it? Because you, you, you want to apologize. and they, they don't pick up the phone, you can't apologize. And so here, part of the terror that Joel is pronouncing is that God is going to take away from them even the means by which they would have ordinarily repented of their sin. And they're going to have to await a greater sacrifice, Christ, and a greater temple, Christ. And thankfully for us as Christians, we don't have to fear that our means of forgiveness is ever going to be cut off for us. Okay. But, they, but they would be in terror here. Now, as I begin to wrap up, I do want to make one thing clear before I show you the purpose of the book. I do want, I do want you to know this, that this plague is not at all seen as a natural disaster or as some sort of a coincidental concurrence of natural means in the world. But this plague is obviously sent from God, by God, for the purposes of God. That point is, is hard to ignore in the book of Joel. Look at, look at chapter 1, same chapter, but look at verse 15. This plague is clearly sent by God. Look at this verse. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, as destruction from the Almighty it comes. You see that? God sent this. No question about it. God sent this locust plague to the people. We don't know what year it was, but we know who sent it. Look again in chapter 2. Flip over to chapter 2, verse 25. 225. God says, and here's a promise, thankfully. Hope and mercy showing up here. Verse 25, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. So who sent the locust plague? Answer, God did. Why did he do it? Well, that's the last question we have to answer before we wrap up this morning. God sends this judgment on the people with a very particular purpose in mind, we see that purpose in two places in our chapter today. Let's look at verses 8 
And let's look at verse 11. 8 says this, Laments like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. And then verse 11 says, Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil. Wail, O wine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. God sends this judgment on the people of God for one reason, and that is to induce in them and to elicit from them lamentation. You know what that word means, lamentation? I trust you do. It's not a word that we use very commonly. Uh, we, We may think of lamentation as some sort of profound sadness or grief in the heart. That's only partially right. But biblically, when we lament, we are grieved because of the sin, not only of ourselves, but we are grieved because the sins of the nation. Okay? We are grieved because of our sins collectively as people and as individuals. And so what do we do when we lament? Well, we, we, we throw ourselves upon the mercies of God. Because where else can we go? And unfortunately, even modern evangelicals have lost almost all sense of what the word lamentation even means. We just don't know because we don't practice lamentation very much. It means to lament your sin and the sins of your nation or your people. To to cry out against yourself, to plead for God for mercy. And unfortunately, um, we have become so much better at blaming others and dodging responsibility, and shifting responsibility, and denying faults, that unfortunately we've almost completely lost the ability to lament, even as the people of God, right? We have a whole book of the Bible called Lamentations. Maybe we should read it more often, perhaps. But if if we've lost a sense of what it means to lament, then let, let verse 11 help to clarify it for us when he tells us to be ashamed. Now, I know you don't like that word any more than I do. Be ashamed, right? I don't like to feel ashamed, do you? None of us do. And, and unfortunately, almost our entire culture is, is trying to move away from the idea that shame has any place in our hearts and our lives anymore. And think about the secular culture. Think about the progressive ideologies. They don't want shame to be part of anything. They want people to fully embrace themselves and their proclivities and their desires and their nature. Why would you be ashamed of that if you're celebrating but, but, but listen, and please, please try to hear me here. Shame is actually extraordinarily valuable in the believer's life because it, because it does two things. The first thing shame does is it wants to drive you away from whatever it is that brought shame into your life, right? It induces change. We hate the feeling of be, being ashamed. That's why it's so good. It's like putting your hand on a hot oven. The reason it burns is because you want to tear your hand off that oven as quickly as you can. That's what shame does. It wants wants to induce us to remove ourselves from the very thing that is bringing about that such such a negative affection. Yet at the same time, please hear this, shame also has the positive value of driving us to the cross. If you don't want to live in shame and grief for your sins anymore, then go to the one who can take it away from you. And that is for us Christ. And so yes, the book of Joel, uh, even though he's going to use shame as a tool to cause us to lament and to repent, Joel is also, as all prophets does, Joel is also going to use shame for the positive purpose of driving us to Jesus Christ. And so I just want to ask you this as we close. Do you feel shame? If so, you know where to take it. Take it to him. Throw at his feet. Go to the cross and find yourself relieved by his mercies and his grace.